The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Blue Apron. Great. The n- <laughs> Blue Apron's the number one fresh ingredient recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. The you number know. two uh, one is a prison. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Just saying that they're far ahead of their competitors. Cooking together builds strong family bonds. Research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. Those who spend a lot at restaurants or high-end grocery chains can now spend under $10 per person for a delicious meal. More like whole paycheck, you know? I'm not the kind of person that says that. (laughs) Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Love it never gets bored with this. The featured upcoming meals include beef teriyaki stir fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice, and three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. From now on, I'm not doing fake recipes unless I'm really happy with the idea that I had. Sounds delicious. <laughs> Each meal comes with a step by step, easy to follow recipe card and pre portioned ingredients and can be prepared in just 40 minutes or less. The Blue Apron Freshness Guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. How can they make it right? I don't know. Maybe they'll get you something else. Okay. On demand. Whatever you want from Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash crooked. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals. You know, we gloss over that line, how good it feels and tastes. It's weird. It's my least favorite line. (laughs) And we just sort of do it because we got to get to the slogan, which we do enjoy. You know who's going to have plenty of time to do some cooking with Blue Apron right now? Who? James Comey. (laughs) Yeah, he's going to finally learn to cook. Do they have aprons for men that tall? (laughs) Sitting in the kitchen, got his pre-portioned ingredients. I only have two options, bake or grill. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Go to blueapron.com slash crooked. Blueapron.com slash crooked. Blue Apron is... A better man Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On the pod today, we have former White House counsel and friend of the pod, Kathy Rumler. Uh, she's going to talk to us all about her legal advice in in such a situation that we're now in. Um, <laughs> you should also check out uh, Pod Save the World from yesterday. Tommy woke up at 5.30 in the morning and did an impromptu interview with former Department of Justice spokesman Matt Miller about James Comey's firing. Uh, so go check that out. And tomorrow, Friday, on With Friends Like These, Anna Marie Cox talks to Ben Howe, a never-Trump conservative, uh, who has some advice for the left about the Tea Party's successes and failures. And uh, she also talks to Brandy Jensen about Ivanka Trump. So check that out tomorrow. And then, of course, on Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, May 17th, we will all be at the Ace Hotel in Los Angeles with our special guest, Mayor Eric Garcetti. So that should be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. Get to LA. We'll see if the LA crowd is as lit as the San Francisco crowd. I, it's, I'm telling you, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was something right there. Re- um, really doing my hometown proud. We should one day like we should have some sort of contest where whoever like calls the most voters or knocks the most doors, we will give them access to the San Francisco live show Q and A. I mean, it's nothing for us to be embarrassed about. I want everyone to know that. I'm, I'm fine no, we, with our We answers. were amazing. Let's it's be the, very clear. It's the questioners. <laughs> <laughs> I just want hey, We're protecting the questioners here. Um, okay. So I think there's a little bit going on in the news today. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Ugh, what a clusterfuck. I, I want you to know <laughs> that I, I came up with that term yesterday. Clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for priming the pump on this conversation. <laughs> Unbelievable. I couldn't we're talking about uh Trump claiming that he came up with the phrase prime the pump uh in an interview with the economist of all places. Um which uh, you sent oh, me that you I sent love me that, that guy. you sent me that transcript this morning. It was like 6 a.m. and I'm like reading through it I was like I there's too much to focus. I can't read another interview where Donald Trump sounds like a fucking moron. Like, I mean, the, t- the Economist was quite a thing. The Time Magazine interview, where he brought the Time reporters, had the Time reporters over for a four course dinner, and then brought them in to show them something he was very proud of the 60 inch screen TV that he had added to the president's private study. And his TiVo, because he, um, <laughs> he, records, he records all the morning and daytime cable shows, and then he plays them back and gets angry late at night. 
I think it's very and then healthy. Maybe he does some, ra- and then he makes some perhaps rash decisions. Right. Like firing the director of the FBI, which is what we'll be talking about. So uh, this happened on Tuesday. Uh, we were having a crooked media retreat. So we had no laptops, no phones. We were all sitting at the table trying to plan the future of the company. And um, and then we took a break and someone saw that this, this uh, news alert came up that Comey was fired and we all turned on cable. We turned on CNN and there in one of the 45 boxes on the screen was Dan Pfeiffer. I know, I was. <laughs> um, this is pretty good. So I would... I. <laughs> About 15 to 20 minutes before the news happened, I was already scheduled to do CNN in a fortuitous moment as oh, a CNN wow. contributor. Lucky. And I was doing a call with the producer, and the topic was going to be Comey. About, really? Because this was on the heels of the Comey testimony. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the criticism of Comey for misstating how the, the, how the emails ended up on Huma Abedin's laptop. Right. And so the question the producer asked me, she's, do you think uh, Comey should be fired? And I said, that's insane. <laughs> that's the, the FBI director is the one official in Washington who can't be fired. They serve 10-year terms. You absolutely can't fire him. It's a moot point. We shouldn't even talk about it. Hang up the phone. Feel pretty good about how I schooled this producer on how things work in D.C. Sat down at my desk, looked at my, at my phone, and then my phone exploded. And it, I went back and looked at our text chain over this that we have with Tommy and some, and Ben Rhodes and Cody Keenan. And <laughs> it's just me saying, holy shit. And then you saying, wow. <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all we, that's all we had. Um, that's really funny. So you, were, so you weren't one of those Democrats that said, absolutely, he should be fired. I've lost confidence in him. No, I, I had, I talk, I'm, I don't know whether we were talking about someone keeping it at 1600, but I, whenever the in the middle of the Comey fiasco, when the Democrats were saying Hillary should fire him, I was like, Hillary obviously can't fire him. Like that's insane. Like why are we even saying this? Of course he can't be fired. He's the FBI director, and he was. In, it's just it was so insane. So, like I am one of the few Democrats, I guess, who can defend his 2016 statements about this. But yeah, I mean, even what the Democrats said is irrelevant to what actual to what why what actually happened. Yeah. Well, also like I just remember thinking like I was unbelievably pissed when Comey, you know, released the letter a week before the election. I thought it was crazy. I've been unbelievably critical of it. But as soon as Trump becomes president, like, I was instantly thinking, of course he needs to keep Comey on this job because the last thing we'd want in the world is a fucking Trump pick for the FBI. Like, I feel like we've all sort of known that from the from day one, you know? Well, I don't, of course, I, it'd be like Bo Deedle or like right. Rudy Giuliani or some Fox News contributor. <laughs> right. It seems like no amount, like whatever Comey did to Hillary Clinton, whatever he screwed up, like it made us all mad, but like in no way would that, have, would that somehow be worse than a person that Trump would appoint to the FBI. I mean, when he had his pick for DOJ, when you have fucking Jeff Sessions now. So, so you know, let's... when uh, when Trump fired Sally Yates, yeah. who was the acting attorney general who refused to enforce his uh, Muslim ban. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people went around saying, this is like Watergate. This is like Watergate. And it really wasn't right. It was. I mean, it was the acting attorney general. I think it was he should not have fired her. She was has been proven right by multiple courts, uh, right. both in Hawaii and on the mainland U.S. That she made the right decision. <laughs> um, but this is like some people overstated the case back then. But when you fire the person who is in charge of investigating you for colluding with Russia to tilt the election in your favor, that's when the Watergate thing doesn't seem so crazy. No, it makes Watergate look like a fucking technicality. I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. So before before we get into the like five billion White House sources who leaked to the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, let's just start with what's on the public record. Maybe you're not inclined to believe the the millions and millions of sources who are leaking. Um, so over the last several months, Comey has a testified that there's absolutely no evidence to support. Trump's lie that Barack Obama wiretapped him, and B, testified that the FBI is investigating whether people on the Trump campaign colluded with Russia to interfere with the 2016 elections. Trump hated that Comey said these things. How do we know that? 
Well, he tweeted about it constantly. <laughs> over and over again, Trump tweeted about how the Russia investigation was fake news, about how history was going to prove him right about the wiretapping claim. Last week, Trump tweeted that former director of national intelligence James Clapper said that there was no evidence of collusion, even though there was an, a, an old quote from Clapper because he left the government four months ago, so he would have no knowledge of an FBI investigation. Um, and then Trump had an aide actually paste his tweet about Clapper on his Twitter background. Remember, that was just like yesterday or two days ago. Um, so we know so we know he was fairly testy about this. Um, and then, of course, on Tuesday, he fires Comey and makes up a bizarre rationale for it. I mean, <laughs> it's just... I- it's so funny. The when I was on CNN, so let's talk about what the rationale was. Yeah. So the rationale was um, that that James Comey had, uh, in Sarah Huckabee, the uh, Sean Spicer's just replacement in waiting here. Sarah Huckabee, the White House press sec- deputy press secretary, said that Comey had committed quote atrocities um, in his investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails. So that's the rationale. That was yes. the original rationale. We have since yes. changed it. Yes, Jim Comey is the Pol Pot of FBI directors. Right. That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. I mean, so originally, originally the White House said that Trump decided to fire Comey because the Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein recommended it. Um, so you have a memo from Rosenstein that says, here's all the ways that Comey broke with longstanding Department of Justice policy in his handling of Hillary's email investigation. And hey, John, you, quick question. Sure. Was, do you, was Attorney General Sessions allowed to be involved in matters including the Russia investigation? Um, no, because he recused himself because he lied to Congress about meeting with the Russian ambassador. Yes, a Russian ambassador who is known by many to be part of Russian intelligence. Right. And because because he neglected to tell Congress that when he was asked if he had met with any Russians, he recused himself from any matters related to the Russian investigation, except when he decided to write a memo recommending the firing of the man who was leading the investigation. Yes. Just so I just want to get all these things on the record. So that's like, very normal. Work. Very normal. Um, so Rosenstein writes a memo to Sessions. Sessions then writes a memo to Trump. And uh, and then and then Trump fires them. Um, Trump also so then but then by Wednesday, uh, the White House said actually Trump has been thinking about firing Comey since November, and then became strongly inclined after his testimony last week, which doesn't really hold up with the fact that then you the Deputy Attorney General writes a memo. Um, a couple days before the firing about all the things he did in the Hillary Clinton investigation. Right? Yeah, the, no one, zero people believe this. None. Zero. Well, they just, I mean, the White House changed the story. The White House contradicted the White House. Forget about all the sources. Forget about whether you believe the fake news or not. The White House fucking changed their story. Yes, they they did. I'm going to give you my professional opinion here. They did not handle this well. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I just there's so much about this um, that is worth picking apart. Rod Rosenstein, I don't know the man. Mm-mm. All I know is that he was voted unanimously by the Senate. Obviously, we don't agree with him on many, many things. But he had, I believe, a pretty sterling reputation in the weird bipartisan clubbiness that is like Ivy educated lawyers. And right. he basically decided like he's only on the job for a couple of weeks now, I think to take the years of work that he had done building up this reputation, serving as a clerk to a judge, as a U.S. attorney, a prosecutor and lighting it on fire for Donald Trump. So bizarre. I don't know. I would love to know what's going on in Rod Rosenstein's mind. Well, then in the Washington Post masterpiece that we'll get to shortly. Masterpiece. Sources close to Rod Rosenstein say he threatened to quit. Oh, right. you threatened to quit? Well, who gives a fuck? Quit or don't quit. Do not bug me with sources close to you with your background quotes about how you 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 threatened to quit because you've been thrown under the bus for this. Well, yes, yeah, and quit. the reason he threatened to quit is because apparently in the first days of this, the Trump administration said, oh, it was all Rosenstein's doing. He was the one who wrote the memo recommending the firing of Comey, and Trump just went along with the memo. Rosenstein heard this, got really pissed, 
threatened to quit. I don't know why he didn't follow through with it. Um, of course, today the DOJ said, the, spo- the official spokesperson of the Department of Justice said, no, 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 that's categorically false. He never quit and threatened to quit. Yeah, yeah, we believe everything you say. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, but he did, yeah, he didn't go through with it for some reason. Maybe because he has already sold the soul to the devil that is Donald Trump. Yeah, this is this is the person this is the person we're depending on to appoint a special prosecutor. Yeah. Rough. This is Pod Save America. Stick around. There's more great show coming your way. Pod Save America is brought to you by Pro Flowers. Mother's Day is this weekend. Oh shit. <laughs> That's what I said. Oh shit. I forgot. Mother's Day is this weekend. You can still send the hundred blooms for mom bouquet from Pro Flowers in time for Mother's Day. And wow her with these bright, colorful flowers. Something to think about. It comes with a free glass vase for just $19.99, plus shipping and handling. She'll say, wow, you almost didn't remember. (laughs) And if you really want to make a statement, you can upgrade to a premium vase and include gourmet chocolates for just $10 more. Obviously, you want to include the gourmet chocolates. Yeah. Choose the delivery date you want, and Pro Flowers guarantees your flowers will arrive fresh and beautiful and stay that way for at least seven days, or you get your money back. This is a no-brainer. Everyone should go do this. Yeah. Go sure. buy your mom some Pro Flowers. Add the chocolates. Buy your grandma some Pro Don't Flowers. Don't get the shitty glass face. Get the premium glass face. Buy your dad some flowers. Buy anyone flowers. Click on the microphone in the top right corner of their proflowers.com website and use the code CROOKED. You'll get these stunning flowers and free glass vase starting at just nineteen ninety nine. That's proflowers.com. Code CROOKED when you click on the mic. Order today before you're out of time and Pro Flowers is out of this bouquet. What a disaster that would be. Pro Flowers. A better way. A to, better way to flower. A better way. To... Prod Save America is also brought to you by Tommy John. So this is very exciting. Very we, uh, exciting. We issued a bit of a challenge to the Tommy John people, where we were relentlessly critical of their advertising writing, and uh, they responded by not giving us any, <laughs> <laughs> as as if to say both thank you, we're listening, and also fuck you, we're listening. Looking at you, Blue Apron Pro Flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give control to us. We'll so, we'll sell your products. Let's see how we're doing so far. Yeah, so far, I have so to say, far, not great. Not great. Not great. Could have used the copy. Let's talk about Tommy John underwear. I know it's your favorite. I will tell you. It's been, a, it's been a long time favorite of yours from before we were ever podcasters. Again, I Googled Tommy John underwear and what popped up was a company and I decided to support it. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, it is my... <laughs> this, they're very comfortable underwear. They're my go-to. Basically, listen, I'm not going to say the other brand of my backups, but like, you know how it is. You have, you know, you have the clothes you like to wear, and then you have the clothes that you're wearing when it's closer to laundry day. Right. And, uh, and the uh, goal is to clear out the laundry day clothes and replace it and with the good clothes. And have one brand that you can just, no matter when you stick your hand in that underwear drawer, you're you finding out, something yeah, good. Right. Every time you reach in, you pull out, you're like, I'm happy today. Tommy John makes you happy. It does. And the, um, and I really. <laughs> You'll never forget how good it tastes it is... and feels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Cool it. Cool it. All I, like, Wrong it has out. been my dream. To be able to have a drawer full of socks and underwear that's completely coordinated, where you don't have to think about it, right? You're not making a choice. You know, we all have decision fatigue, right? That's why Mark Zuckerberg always wears the one T-shirt when he's running for president and then lying about it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want my one underwear type to be Tommy John because I'm so happy. I really, it does improve your day a little bit to not be wearing one of you know the Conti Bot. Let's say you know I'm gonna not gonna say a store name, but let's say it's the thing you shoot an arrow at. <laughs> Plus, all Tommy John underwear is backed by the best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee. Hurry to TommyJohn.com slash crooked. Get 20% off your first order. That's TommyJohn.com slash crooked for 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash crooked. Tommy John underwear. A better way to, uh, you know, have things under your clothes. So you go through these TikToks, but one, the, both the New York Times and the Washington Post. The Washington Post one is really the masterpiece, even though both are quite good. Apparently, Trump made up his mind during a round of golf in New Jersey over the weekend. Um, well, I, actually, <laughs> technically, before and after the golf round, when he was watching cable and he, yeah, as he does, screaming at the television. As he does, he was just looking through that TiVo. It was like 98% full, so he had to clear out some old Morning Joe episodes. And what did he come across? Things that James Comey said that made him very angry. Um, so, uh, so he goes back to D.C. on Monday and he tells Don McGahn, who is the White House counsel, Jared Kushner, his um, grifting son-in-law, and uh, Mike Pence, the vice president. And uh, he tells them he wants to move forward and fire Comey. Um, no one stops him. No one tries to stop him. There's some reports that that Bannon and Priebus um, 
thought that the timing was off, that maybe he should wait a little bit, but no one was really against this. And so he then has Sessions and Rosenstein write up the memos, and then he fires them. And then, and then, uh, no one in the West Wing knows until about an hour before this happens, the communications team is alerted. You always want to tell your communications team that you're firing the FBI director about an hour before you do it. it gives them a lot of time to prepare. Um, so Sean, poor Sean Spicer <laughs> and, uh, and the communications director were alerted an hour before the news was announced. Most West Wing aides didn't know at all. They just found out when their, uh, when their phones got you know breaking news alerts. And then the whole thing happened. And Sean, Sean Spicer. Do you want to talk about Sean Spicer and the bushes? Because I wasn't paying much attention to the news yesterday because I was very busy. And then I like looked on Twitter and everyone's talking about Sean. There's like a whole bunch of Sean Spicer bushes memes. And I had no idea what was going on. Okay, let's do a TikTok of Sean Spicer's evening. So <laughs> late in the afternoon, I think he might have briefed that day. I don't know. He's somewhere on Naval Reserve. I don't really know. But anyway, he gets called in the Oval Office with Mike Dubkey, who's the White House Communications Director, right. who no one... He's like Jared Kushner. No one's ever heard his voice or seen his face. They don't know who he is. And they say, uh, so we're firing the um, Attorney General or the FBI Director. Here's what we're doing. Someone writes a statement. <laughs> Spicer goes to his computer to send the statement to the press. Um but for some reason, and this, I don't think this is Sean Spicer's fault, sometimes the technology does not work awesome in the White House, uh, i.e. healthcare.gov, <laughs> the statement is not sending out fast enough. So he, according to reports, he goes to the briefing room, and opens the door, yells out the news, closes the door, goes back up to his office, locks, there's a door that blocks where the press work and where the press secretary sits that is always open. Yeah. He locks the door, goes in his office, hides in his office, <laughs> watch all hell break loose. Donald Trump is eating, goes home to eat a well-done steak with ketchup. That's my ad. That's not actually in the uh, Washington <laughs> Post story, but I'm just assuming that to be the case and is watching cable news. And he is surprised and concerned to find that people think this is a big deal and gets very upset. He sends signal down to his staff. Through, I don't know whether that's like through a raven or he yells through a can on a string. I don't really know. And tells them that he wants his people on TV defending him. So uh, they go down to the uh, the basement where they have locked Kellyanne Conway for the last few months. Unlock her. Take her out. Spicer goes out on TV. And so Spicer goes out to the North Lawn in front of the White House to do some Fox interviews to essentially preach to the choir. The press, who can get answers to no questions, sees that Fox, that Sean Spicer is right outside on TV. And so they gather uh, in one of the few smart collective actions the press has ever taken. And they gather waiting for him to come off the TV. He basically hides in the bushes so they can't interview him. And they are now demanding, answer our questions, answer our questions. And he, through an aide, says he will take questions, but not on camera, but while he's still hiding in the bushes, and then demands that the TVs turn the lights off so it'll be in the dark, and therefore they can't use the footage of him. I mean... This is a sign that Sean Spicer is not good at his job, because of course they're going to use the footage. He's just going to look sketchy in the dark. Once the lights go off, he steps out of the bushes, and is like, he's surrounded by bushes. He basically kind of like pokes his head out like a like some sort of uh, turtle and answers some questions, then runs back into the West Wing and hides, never to be seen again. Six more weeks of stonewalling. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> the whole thing is so good. I mean, in these reports, Trump is very upset at his communications team. Very he, upset. Very upset. He blames them for this. He, there are reports that he is actively thinking about firing Spice and replacing him with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who we can get to in a minute. And while while Spicer's away say, on like on his naval is, reserve duty, thank you for your service, yeah. Sean. <laughs> that's, that's right. Really nice, he, great, great boss. Here's the thing I'll say about and to defend Sean Spicer for the first time and the last time on this pod. This is not his fault. No, I don't. It's not like they only gave him an hour, and that would be an insane amount of time to announce the president's position on transportation reform. Like you need time to do things, but they could have given him. A decade to prepare. They could have gone back in time and told Sean Spicer in 2007 to prepare for this moment, and he would not be able to prepare because it's unfucking spinnable. It is the most insane thing 
that Trump has done by far. It's not even, it is so crazy. The people around him are incompetent for allowing him to do this. My, incompetent. My, my fa- the detail that made me laugh the hardest in the Washington Post story, Tommy texted it to us last night and I just lost it. When asked Tuesday night for an update on the unfolding situation, one top White House aide simply texted a reporter to fireworks emoji. <laughs> <laughs> which I am I am just using for anything from now on. I'm sending people the two fireworks emoji when things are fucked up. Do you um, think they texted that to Earth emoji and he responded with the fireworks emoji? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was Ashley Parker that got the fireworks emoji. That's I'm I'm oh. guessing it was friend of the pot Ashley Parker. Um yeah. Okay, so a couple other details have dribbled out over the last couple of days. The Wall Street Journal reported that Comey was concerned by information showing possible evidence of collusion, which is very serious. There was also reports that he that Comey was requesting additional resources from uh, the Department of Justice to pursue the Russia investigation. Now, Andrew McCabe, who's testifying, uh, who's the acting director of the FBI right now, who's testifying before Congress as we're recording this, said that he did not make an official request, but basically he told... Uh, Senator Richard Burr and Mark Warner, who were the heads of the Senate Intel Committee, that one of the things that was slowing down the investigation was that he didn't have access to prosecutors at the Department of Justice because Rod Rosenstein hadn't started yet. And there was no one really leading the investigation at DOJ because DOJ because Sessions recused himself. So we know that um, that Comey was looking for access to prosecutors at DOJ to continue this investigation. We also know that a grand jury in Virginia had subpoenaed records uh, connected to Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor. So a grand jury is now involved. So feels like this investigation was probably getting somewhere. Of course, we don't know. Again. We have no idea what this investigation might uncover. All we know is that Trump seems to be doing everything possible with no worries about how it looks to stop the investigation. That's all we know. Trump also said in the letter where he fired Comey that Comey had told Trump three times that Trump wasn't under investigation. This, of course, would have been in violation of Department of Justice protocols to not discuss ongoing investigations with the White House, particularly when the people in that White House are targets of the investigation. And there was random FBI officials on background that said that um, that the Trump's assertion that Comey told him he wasn't under investigation was farcically untrue. Farcically untrue is a good, is a good name is a for, great the, for the history of the, of the Trump presidency. That might be the title of this episode. Oh, good call. Good call. There we go. We got it. I always worry about that. Okay. So what do we do about this? It's all, I mean, this would be like riveting reality television if it was happening in another country and it wasn't like, you know, the downfall of our republic here. But um, so now we look to Congress to rein in the executive branch's, you know, absurd craziness here. I'm going to, I think it is an abuse of power because... Yeah, yes, the president has the authority to fire the FBI director. Absolutely. That is, it's not illegal to do that. That is part of what you do. Firing an FBI director who's investigating your campaign for possible collusion with a foreign adversary does, in fact, seem, without, without naming a special, pro, or encouraging uh, the DOJ to name a special prosecutor, that does seem like an abuse of power to me. Do you think it's abuse of power and potentially impeachable abuse of power? I don't know. We should ask. We should. We have, we're going to have a lawyer on the phone in a little bit. Oh, so a very well qualified, a very attorney. well qualified lawyer. Um, yeah, so very I, different I, than Don McGahn, who uh, I'm not. Who may have his law degree from Trump University. <laughs> so let's let's look to Congress. Uh, Republican reaction, as usual, a bunch of courageous heroes there. Um, so the New York Times has a very uh, has a great feature. They're doing like a running list of. Uh, what everyone everyone in Congress's reactions are to this. So if you look at uh, which Republicans have called for a special prosecutor, zero. Number of Republicans who's called who've called for an independent investigation or commission, five. Senator McCain and four congressmen. If you the number of Republicans who have questions or concerns about what has happened, numbers at thirty four. So no one else really seems that worried. Did you watch the video of Marco Rubio's response to this? Oh, man. I didn't. I saw the quote, and that was was all I could handle. Marco Rubio has become 
like, yeah, maybe we're not super fair to Marco Rubio all the time, and we make fun of him, and Lovett calls him Marcus Rubenstein, but he has basically become the Pot Save America caricature of himself. He he gets caught at <laughs> some event. He's like, yeah, well, it happened. Trump fired him. It's his call, and um, well, you know, we'll uh, see where we go from here. <laughs> it's like, we're just going to wait. We're going to say nothing and see which way the political winds blow, and then we will pick our position. It's really bad. It's very like I actually thought that the Lindsey Grahams of the world would be very upset about this. Um, not like Lindsey Grahams, you know, courageous on every issue by any means, but on the Russia stuff, he's at least been a little better. And he was like, "Yeah, no, it's fine. Trump, Trump can do whatever he wants." I, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. I think that they they're doing what the what they've typically done so far in this administration, which is cow to everything Trump does because they want to move forward their legislative agenda to cut taxes for rich people and take away health care from everyone else. But it um, doesn't seem like they're really showing a lot of courage here. Well, if there have been all these Watergate um, like throwbacks and people are like sending around articles from around Watergate and people's statements and the articles of impeachment... And, which got me thinking that if Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell were the leaders of the Republican Party during the time of Watergate, Richard Nixon would have finished his term and spoken at the next year's convention and be lionized as a hero by Republicans. They yeah, would probably. Not, the reason Nixon went down is they were, there was bipartisan concern about that he had abused power in office and he was forced to resign for fear of being thrown out of office. But this is... I mean, I don't want to get like overly Alarmist. concerned or overwrought about this, but in the last two weeks here, the Republicans passed a bill that affected a sixth of the economy without hearings, without an estimate, without a process, without even reading the bill, just jammed it through and didn't just have gone on TV and lied about what it meant, just with no regard for the truth. The president of the United States fires the FBI director, something that was for Boten in Washington before this. It was, it was, this is so far outside the political norms. Fired the FBI director who was investigating him because he was mad the investigation was still going on. And then the Republican Party backs him, repeats his ridiculous talking points, and sticks with him. And just as a side note, two side notes, a reporter asked questions of HHS Secretary Tom Price in West Virginia about the bill that would kick 24 million people off health care, and they had that guy arrested. And the argument was, well, he asked questions outside of designated press areas. And then further that side note, and another alarming piece of news today, Trump has started a uh, voter fraud commission headed by one of the worst people in America, Kansas Attorney General Chris, Chris Kobach. Kobach, which King is basically of, a – He's basically spent his – The idea is to prevent people from voting. This he's is basically, not good. He's basically spent his career uh, prosecuting voters, uh, which I, I think he only – he only won like a few cases, small misdemeanor fines for people uh, voting because uh, they lived in two different places, like uh, like Steve Bannon. Yeah, so Commission on Voter Fraud to, to find those three to five million people who voted illegally. Um, the the lie, the, one of the first big lies he told as president. Uh, also, another scary thing: the census director abruptly quit because uh, he wasn't been Congress wasn't giving him the necessary funds to complete the census in 2020. That's a big deal because the census in 2020 and the census director, like figuring out how many people are in the country, uh, goes directly to congressional redistricting. It goes to resources that go to various states. Uh, so there's an, an enormous amount of uh, power that comes with you know the the census and what the census says. There's an enormous amount of consequences that come with it too. So that was also very frightening. Um, our friend Brian Boitler, friend of the pod, has a great story about this today, um, where he said, "Absent consequences, Trump will rightly feel liberated to appoint whomever he wants to run the IRS when the current commissioner's term expires later this year. More alarmingly, he will know that he can get away with ordering a crackdown on voting rights or investigations of his political enemies. When loyalty and corruption become job qualifications for political appointees, the president will have the power he needs to stifle protest leaders, judges, the free press, and political rivals. He won't even have to make threats." I think it's an important point because it's not authoritarianism that comes like we've seen in other countries with, you know, overt threats like that. It is he basically he's everyone around him is saying uh, Comey was fired because Comey wasn't loyal and Comey was independent. And so people now know 
that to work for Trump, even in a uh, quasi-independent role or a role that has traditionally been fiercely independent, um, you have to be loyal to him. And if you're not, you get fired. Are you watching or have you watched The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu? No. Em- <laughs> Emily has been watching it and she says that um, she likes like kind of scary shows and stuff like that. She, t- she told me it would be a little too much for me. <laughs> yeah, it, but I kind of want to watch it now because Emily and Lauren have been talking Sunday, about it nonstop, and it felt different on Tuesday. Uh, and, I, gotta, I mean, the I basic watch it. premise is I won't get deep into it, but it's about a dystopian future. But America sort of stumbles into it with a couple of things that happen, and before they know it, there are laws passed that women can't work and you can enslave women. But it just happens kind of slowly, and then that's the scary part. Right. I'm not saying that's going to happen here. Let's not. Yeah. I'm not being a snowflake. Back off, people. But we are entering territory that the the guardrails of government are coming off pretty quickly. You know, Mark Salter, who's I was just been about John to say McCain's this. top advisor forever, yeah. tweeted something to the effect of, "He never thought he'd say this, but Democrats winning Congress may be the only thing that can save democracy." And it, yeah, so the security of the United States depends on uh, a Democratic Congress in 2018. Yeah. That, John I mean, McCain's John McCain's longest serving aide, his speechwriter. This is the thing that has been the scariest to me that has happened since we've been here. Because I've always kind of believed that there are stop gaps in the you know there are things I think that would prevent Trump from actually starting like a major like would just like sort of launching bombs in North Korea or something. Like that. There would be the military has a process that sort of possibly add some deliberation to this. So that worries me. But does, but this is something – and then the other rest of the stuff is policy. It's terrible policy. It affects people's lives. But this is something total that I think opens a door to a new way of – it really – I mean, I think you're right. It is authoritarianism aided and abetted by the uh, – by one of the co-equal branches of government. The jo- one of the jobs of Congress is put a check on power of the president, and they are not – that is not what they want to do. They want to give him as much power as possible. And it's, it is alarming on a whole host of levels because we are all like 110 days in here, people. <laughs> like we got a long way to go yeah, uh, I mean, before we can do anything. And even people like Mike Pence, who seems to be really terrible in a lot of things, but he was a governor. He was a member of Congress. He is a far right, but normal ish Republican and he's just like, yeah, fire the FBI director. Do that. That seems normal. Like, what the fuck? It's important for everyone to remember, we would not be in this frightening a situation were it not for the Republican Congress that we have. The system, the system of government is not broken. The checks and balances remain in place to stop this man from his own lunatic incompetence. But the Republican Party, the elected Republican Party in Washington, has failed the United States of America so incredibly by just letting all this happen. It is so pathetic. And they all, every last one of them deserves to be voted out of office in 2018. And if we have a democratic Congress, we won't, I mean, we'll still have to worry about plenty of things over, you know, between 2018 and 2020 when hopefully we can elect someone who's not Trump. But, um, most of the abuses can be curtailed by a Congress that actually wants to check the power of the president. And, we don't have Republicans who want to do that right now. We don't. That doesn't I, matter. What doesn't matter what Donald Trump does. They just they do not want to stand up for it. It's pathetic. I think this changes the way Democrats have to approach this. Right? Like you and I asked this question. This was the Favreau question. Why didn't Democrats hold the funding of the government hostage to prevent? Why did they? Why did they? Why did they not refuse to give their votes for funding of the government unless the Republicans? To basically prevent the Republicans from passing wealth care, no zero people answered us. Not a right. single person um, came back to us. So I still don't know the answer to that. I will probably know the answer. But this is th- like where Democrats have to play hardball now, like absolute hardball. 
Well, you, you know what? what? There, there was a story about, like, Chuck Schumer was saying, oh, we're going to pull out all the procedural tricks to grind government to a halt until uh, a special prosecutor is named, right? So yesterday they tried to pull some, you know, tried to slow down business. They successfully did. You know, Schumer was delaying a bunch of things, which is great. Susan Collins was all mad at him. She's like, oh, this is ridiculous. And she's like a moderate, you know, she's like, this is stupid that we're holding this up. But there's this whole story about it. Um, I forget where, but I'll retweet it. Um about like what the Democrats haven't come to a consensus on how to deal with this. And someone asked Tim Kaine, like, oh, do you think that the Democrats should delay everything in the Senate and hold up government until there's a special prosecutor? And Tim Kaine's like, I don't know about that. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. No, no, Tim Kaine. You should. (laughs) The Democrats in the Senate should hold up government until a special prosecutor is appointed. And again, it's like the special prosecutor may not find anything. This investigation may not uncover collusion. I don't want to be one of those liberals who thinks like, yes, absolutely. We're going to find out collusion with Russia. Trump's going down. There's a P tape, all of that shit. I don't know. I don't I'm not one of these people who think this. But like for the sake of democracy and the institutions in this country, we have to have a special prosecutor to give people faith that this this investigation is being conducted with some semblance of independence. We have to have that. This is presuming too much, but do you know who should really want an, a, an independent prosecutor? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Right. Yes, because now when whatever – he wants this behind him. He claims to believe he didn't do anything. And now when his hand-picked FBI director, who will be rubber-stamped by the Republicans in the Senate, who you know who will go immediately from the, from the set of the five to the FBI office – if when they come back and if if really nothing really happened and they say that no one will believe it right. if a special prosecutor who is democrats have endorsed comes back and says nothing has happened some democrats will not believe it the you know sort of louise louise mensch democrats are not going to believe it but the <laughs> world but it will be credible to a lot of people and you can put it behind yourself like these are not the actions like i don't these are not the actions of a man who believes he's innocent no they're not. We've been, we've been saying this all along, and every time he just keeps up in the ante. But yeah, no, they're, they are not. Okay, we're going to get to Kathy, who's probably waiting for us to give her a ring. So when we come back, we will have former White House counsel Kathy Rumler. Don't go anywhere. This is Pod Save America, and there's more on the way. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. You know what I was wearing the other day? What? The hat that the ZipRecruiter people gave me. I was drinking from the water bottle. Really? <laughs> yeah, look at us. It's also a very nice backpack. I have a lot of ZipRecruiter uh, merch and I'm using it. And guess what? Quality candidates have just come rolling in ever since yeah, every, we've been... Yeah, <laughs> everywhere I go with the Zoop Recruiter backpack on, I, you know what it is? I leave my house, the backpack's empty. By the time I get home, it's filled with resumes, and I'm not People really sure how it's happening. People are throwing resumes at us as we're walking down the street just because of the Zoop Recruiter <laughs> Recruit <hat>. me! <laughs> if you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites, and now you can with Zoop Recruiter. You can post your job to 200-plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter. Which is on <laughs> <laughs> All with a single click. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll on into their easy-to-use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. You can quickly screen candidates. You can rate them. You hire the right person. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by Fortune 100 companies and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. You know whose resume might be on there now? It might be James Comey's. It might be James Comey's. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps there's a whole bunch of other candidates for the next FBI director who will soon get sacked by Donald uh, Trump who are posting their resumes on ZipRecruiter, too. Are you looking for a seven-foot lawyer too self-righteous for his own good? <laughs> There's a guy named James Comey, and he is available. <laughs> are you looking for someone who will slow the investigation of, into your campaign's possible collusion with a foreign adversary? Go to ZipRecruiter.com. <laughs> you might find that candidate. <laughs> And by the way, by the way, you might want to just leave that post open because I have a feeling that there's going to be several FBI directors coming available over the next couple of years, every six months. Merrick Garland, keep your job. Run, Merrick Garland. You have a lifetime appointment. <laughs> I you was... don't need to be. You don't need to be taking this job where you're going to be fired in a couple days. I don't know what it is, but it turns out Donald Trump investigators uh, expire like milk. <laughs> One more time, try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. <laughs> Important to have some political commentary in the ads. Pod Save America is also brought to you by Squarespace. If you've ever tried to start your own website, you know what a hassle that can be, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Make your next move, make your next website with Squarespace. 
Create a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade, ever. They provide award-winning 24-7 customer support and will help you get your own custom domain with an experience that's fully transparent and simple to set up. Squarespace is used by a wide range of creatives, people, and businesses. Musicians, a little too wide a range these days. <laughs> musicians, that you should leave musicians, in. <laughs> no, don't say leave in. Squarespace is used by a wide range of creatives, people, and businesses. Some say too wide. <laughs> musicians, designers, artists, restaurants, and more. So make your next move. Lock down your domain and create a website to launch that idea. Use offer code CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain with Squarespace. As always on Pod Save America, thanks to our friends at Squarecash, the least annoying way to pay someone back, according to us. Yeah. Also Gizmodo. Yeah, also Gizmodo, but mainly us. With the Cash App, sending and receiving money is free and fast. Most payments can be deposited directly to your bank account in just a few seconds. Just download the free Cash App, link your debit or credit card, and send money to anyone with a phone number or email address. They'll get a notification they just received cash, which is not annoying at all. I always found the other ones kind of intimidating because it's a little complicated to use. I never set up your... Um, Plus, I don't want the world I'm knowing who I'm paying yeah, for what. Yeah, also, it's like you, you Google Sean Spicer's name, and it's like, oh, look, this is where he bought all that... Uh, Unmatching shoes. That's weird. He bought enough balls to fill a ball pit? That's weird. <laughs> get the Cash App in the App Store or Google Play today. Boom. Square Cash. We really like it. I like, like it. Mm. On the pod today, we have the former White House counsel for President Barack Obama, friend of the pod, Kathy Rumler. Kathy, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Great to be here. Uh, we're happy to have you, finally. So what what do you think about the uh, the crazy situation we're in today? I, I saw early reports said that uh, Don McGahn, who is the White House counsel, the job that you had for Barack Obama, uh, was one of the few aides that Trump confided in about uh, his decision to fire James Comey. Um, and advised him to do this. Could you imagine advising a president to do to do this? Would that have been your legal advice? It's really it, it's unbelievable. I mean, I don't I don't even know where to begin to describe sort of my my shock and awe um, and outrage and anger and sadness about the way the whole thing was handled. But um, to answer your question, no, I can't imagine ever giving that advice. And you all worked with me for a number of years, and you know there's no chance in hell I would have ever given the president the advice. Uh, that he should terminate the FBI director in the in the course of an ongoing investigation, and and certainly not then, you know, provide what I think are pretty transparently pretextual reasons for doing so. And just what would you have said, right? Because a bunch of us political people, communications people, would have been in there saying the optics of doing this are completely fucking insane. But I'm sure you would have given more measured legal advice. <laughs> um, you know, what, <laughs> I would have tried. <laughs> what would you have said? Like, besides the the obvious optics of this, what are some of the problems with doing this? Well, of course, the president. I think, as many people have said, and it's correct, is that as a legal matter, the president has the authority to terminate the FBI director, as um, he does any other member of the cabinet. And um, you know that. So, so he legally has that option. And and I, if I were to advise the president, I would have told him, you legally have the option. Um, to do so, uh, really, for any reason, um, you know, as, as Jim Comey said in his resignation letter, and, and he's right about that. With that said, um, there are a number of other constraints on, you know, the president's exercise of that authority, including political constraints, um, you know, most importantly, sort of prudential constraints, um, the, you know, whether it's sort of the right thing to do. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, is is doing it, and particularly doing it at this time and in this way, um, in a very you know hurried manner, um, messaged in a way that you know sort of fell apart. Uh, the, the narrative that they tried to put out has sort of fallen apart. You know, within the first kind of six hours after the fact, um, you know, is just undermines um, everybody's confidence in kind of the legitimacy of these institutions which is, you know, bad for the White House, it's, it's bad for the country, it's certainly bad for the FBI, it's bad for the Justice Department. So, you know, those are the things that I would have emphasized, you know, to the president. Um, and saying, if you want to, you know, if, look, if you want to do this, if the chemistry is not right, you, you don't have confidence in the, in the FBI director, let's, you know, take our time, um, think about uh, what information we need to inform that decision, and, uh, you know, when is an appropriate time to do it? And there are lots of things, as you guys know, that, that President Obama wanted to do 
um, either personnel-wise or otherwise, that he, he was constrained from doing because uh, the circumstances weren't right and the timing wasn't right. Right. If the reason Trump did this was something was very clear that he was concerned about this investigation and his goal was to stop it, do he and the people around him expose themselves to legal risk for trying to stop an investigation like this? Well, it's a great question. Um, the answer is maybe. You know, it depends on what the facts would be. But the, the legal um, theory that, of liability would be an obstruction of justice theory in that, you know, in that regard. Historically, where, where folks have gotten into trouble um, from a kind of criminal perspective in these, in these types of situations, which I hate to even say, because, of course, everything, it's like every day there's some, you know, completely novel um, situation that comes up in the Trump administration. <laughs> but if you think back to the U.S. attorney firing, which, which you all remember, and I think you know, many of your listeners will remember, mm-hmm. what, what happened there, there actually was a special counsel who was appointed um, by Attorney General McKay uh, her name is Nora Danahy, and she was at the time the acting U.S. attorney in, um, for the District of Connecticut. She was appointed to investigate whether or not senior government officials had um, essentially lied about the reasons for why these U.S. attorneys were fired. And, uh, you know, had lied to Congress, um, had lied in, in, you know, either testimony or in other types of statements to Congress. And so, you know, then that was a multi, multi-year investigation that ultimately didn't conclude and it concluded in no charges being brought but it didn't conclude until as i recall um either 2009 or 2010 but you know well into the obama administration can you talk a little bit about what democrats are calling for a special prosecutor talk about a little bit for listeners like what a special prosecutor is and what that means for folks yeah so most people think about a special prosecutor, and, and you know those of us who are old enough to remember, we we think about Ken Starr, um, and it, there were of course a number of other independent counsels appointed under a under a law, a statute that existed um, at the time that had a sunset provision, which means that um, it had in order to to stay in existence, it had to be renewed, and and um, it was not renewed, and so that. That legal apparatus to appoint someone like a Ken Starr, who is truly independent from the Justice Department, no longer exists. So when people are talking now about a special counsel, what they're talking about is that the um, the Attorney General, or in this case, the Acting Attorney General, for purposes of this matter, because Jeff Sessions has recused, um, does have the authority to appoint a special counsel, and that's you know been done, and it has been done not frequently, but it has been done in the past. You know, a couple of administrations. Um, it was it was done as I mentioned. Uh, Attorney General Casey did it with uh, with the U.S. Attorney firing investigation. He also did it with respect to the destruction of um, the CIA videotapes of um, you know enhanced interrogation techniques being um, implemented. So that that the special counsel there was um, a guy named John Durham, who's a respected senior prosecutor. And, um, and, of course, Jim Comey himself did it uh, in, the, um, in the Scooter Libby matter, in the Valerie Plain Leak investigation, and he appointed Pat Fitzgerald. So there is definitely precedent for doing it. Um, it, is a, it is a decision that rests with, in this case, it rests with Rod Rosenstein um, as to whether or not it's appropriate in this case. But the thing to remember is that that person, uh, the special counsel, Still, ultimately reports to the deputy attorney general. So, it's 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 not exactly um, independent in the way that we all think about it back in the independent counsel days with someone like Ken Starr. Huh. It's a little bit more independent, but it's you know they're they're, they're still um, supervised and report to um, in this case the deputy attorney general. So that person could be fired just like Comey could be fired. Correct. That's exactly right. Was, were you surprised that Sessions, who had recused himself, was wrote a memo about to Trump about um, firing Comey or about Comey's, you know, mishandling the Clinton investigation 
Um, wasn't that, shouldn't he have not done that because he recused himself from this matter? Well, I think that raises questions that should be asked. And I would expect that, you know, the oversight committees will ask that question. And what was the scope of the re- the recusal? And mm-hmm. who did he get guidance from that this, this would, you know, was okay to weigh in on a personnel matter um, while also being, you know, recused from, from obviously not just the Russia investigation, but he's also said he would be recused from anything relating to um, to Hillary Clinton. I can see the argument for as to as to why a recusal wouldn't apply to him weighing in on um, a weighty matter such as whether the FBI director should be um, terminated or not. But I think it's it's a real question, and I think that um, I saw some reporting this morning that uh, that Chairman Chaffetz of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee has asked the Inspector General to expand uh, his investigation over whether or not the FBI handled the Hillary Clinton email investigation appropriately to now include questions about whether or not um, the termination of the FBI director was handled correctly. <laughs> so, and, and I would not be surprised at all, and I think it would actually be quite appropriate for the Inspector General to expand um, his investigation to also include that. So, you know, we, we far from, if the goal here from the White House was you know, to try to uh, rip the Band-Aid off and move on from these pesky FBI matters. I, I think they did not accomplish that mission. Did Rod Rosenstein's memo that he wrote to Sessions surprise you? I mean, he so he, he detailed, of course, all of the ways that he believed that Jim Comey mishandled the Clinton email investigation, and that was sort of his rationale for, um, you know, he didn't directly recommend his firing, but that was the rationale that the White House gave. Um did that, did that memo surprise you? Is that, is that typical? It's not typical, and it did surprise me. And it did surprise me because it, it largely cited um, sort of validation from a, a opinion writers, you know, outside of the department, and none of whom presumably really understood exactly what factors went into um, Director Comey's decision-making. And so I, I was surprised by the memo. I thought... Um, it was a it was just a very strange memo. It was strange just as a matter of process to have a memo come over to have two memos come over to the White House from the Department of Justice. I mean, you know, the Deputy Attorney General reports to the Attorney General. So normally, when you have a recommendation from the Department of Justice, it comes from the Attorney General. So to me, that was pretty transparent that they were trying to um, to use uh, Rod Rosenstein as um, uh, you know, as a sort of political cover, if you will, because he's a, you know, a career prosecutor. At least that's the way I interpreted it. And it's worth noting for our listeners that you, you are a former prosecutor and involved in uh, taking down Enron and lots of other very important cases. As a former prosecutor, how, it, let's, pre- let's presume for a second that no one appoints a special counsel and Trump gets his hand-picked FBI director. Is it possible in this scenario to actually conduct a thorough investigation and then a prosecution of what's going on here if, the, if a crime is found, or is this sort of crippled in this scenario? I think it is possible, and I think it will it will be done. And the you know the the agents at the FBI are are I think not going to be deterred from following leads um, because of this action. But where it matters. And, and this is why the New York Times story of yesterday was so significant on this whole question. And, and you know, again, I'm just reading what I see in the newspaper, but that that the director, uh, Director Comey, went to the department and asked for additional resources. If that's true, um, that's quite significant because, you know, cases um, get made or not made based on how many resources get dedicated to them. We were able to do the Enron investigation, and we, we were able to prosecute um, – the senior, many senior executives at that company successfully because we, we got an enormous amount of resources, um, you know, from the FBI and from the department, and we there's just no way we could have made that case if we had if we had less resources. And so, you know, that's not that's not sexy um, in terms of explanation, but it's real. It really matters. So if you have two agents, you know, assigned to a matter, it's going to be you know a hell of a lot harder to make a case than if you have five agents assigned um so you know and and you have to you 
the, the policymakers, and so that at the level of the director of the FBI, at the level of the deputy attorney general, um, they, they have to make decisions about how to allocate resources and where folks should be, you know, spending their time. And so, um, you know, who's, who are in those seats really makes a difference in that respect, more so than that, that, that someone would say, you know, stop stop investigating or we don't like where you're going politically, so stop doing that. Because I will just tell you that the career men and women of the FBI, they will not put up with that. And that won't stay within, you know, the walls of the Bureau if that were to happen. How do you think Comey handled the, the Clinton investigation? Obviously, he took some unusual steps during the email investigation, both in holding the press conference in July, sending the letter to Congress, do you agree with his assessment, assessment that he had no choice? He was he could either conceal or, um, or you know, let Congress know what was happening. Or um, what, what do you think about that? I agreed with his assessment that he had a very that he had a very tough choice. Um, I had, you know, concerns. Again, I'm on the outside, so I don't know everything that you know people inside were grappling with, and 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 having sat in those seats. And having been subject to a bunch of criticism myself, I'm always loath to uh, to criticize without having the full facts. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said, you know it was it, it was the, the the manner in which um, that investigation was was handled vis-a-vis the public um, was unorthodox. And uh, and I think you know you you guys know you've worked with me for a long long time. You know I I tend to be um, very process oriented. I tend to be, you know, quite a traditionalist when it comes to following um, norms and traditions because I think that, you know, those those norms are developed for the hard cases, not for the easy cases. And, uh, you know, I, I like many other alums of the department had real questions about why there at least seemed to be a departure from some of the traditional norms about how prosecutors decline cases and, you know, what types of, of extra kind of, you know, extra comments are appropriate to make. And, and, you know, those are some of the things that were laid out in Rosenstein's memo, which I think a lot of folks, um, again, just without knowing all the facts, a lot, of, a lot of Justice Department alumni would say, yeah, those are concerns. You know, now, with that said, the Inspector General at the Justice Department is looking at this very issue. Right. So why in the world wouldn't you wait for the inspector general who is going to interview, you know, the agents at the bureau, who's going to talk to people, who's going to look at the internal correspondence and, and reach informed conclusions about that? Why would you, you know, basically just cut the inspector general's investigation off and say, you know, I've concluded based on the commentary of, of folks in the newspaper that this was not appropriate. That, that, that's puzzling to me. Very good question that the White House uh, refuses to answer. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us and explaining this to us. And, you bet, uh, guys. and thank you for, uh, for keeping us honest all those years, keeping us out of trouble. I tried. <laughs> it's really gone to pot since we left the White House and we didn't have you watching over us. <laughs> <laughs> I, can only, I can only imagine what kind of mischief that y'all are getting into. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show, Kathy. Come on again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, take, take care. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Thanks again to Kathy Rumler for joining Pod Save America today. And everyone have a great weekend. We'll talk to you later. Bye, guys.